Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Serena Chowdhury Pandey. I'm a communications professional in the tech industry. I currently work for Commerce Tools, which is the global leader in composable commerce. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with our esteemed panel. It's our last day of the festival. Let's get the energy going. Can we have a round of applause for the COGEX organizers and for our panelists? Can we clap? <laughs> Okay, in keeping with the energy going, I'm very pleased to introduce next to me Tariq Halal. He's the co-founder and CEO of Moja. Next to him, Ting Ting Peng. She is the Chief Capital Strategy and Impact Officer at Move. And at my far end, I have Philippe Weber, the former MD of Mpesa and the current MD of Advisors. So we're here to talk to you about financial inclusion. It's a hot topic in a world where almost 2 billion people and 2 billion adults don't have access to banking services, yet two thirds of them have access to mobile phones. It's a topic that really can be addressed through innovation, an inclusive mindset and investment. And these three panelists have done some fantastic work. Now, when I think about where the industry has gone and how it started, I really have to cast my mind back to 2007 with the launch of M-Pesa by Vodafone and Safaricom. It was a mobile banking service that really revolutionized how East Africa and East Africans interacted with money. And Philippe, I'd love to start with you there just to learn a little bit about the journey and the lessons learned. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Great to be, uh, to be here. Um, so I've been told we can be controversial today. So the truth is that M-Pesa, who launched in Kenya in 2007, was actually invented here in, uh, in the UK back in 2005 by a product manager of Vodafone, but it did launch first in March 2007 in, uh, in Kenya. And M-Pesa uh, was the really one of the world's first uh, digital wallets. So imagine Revolut launching in Africa 10 years before Revolut. The name M-Pesa, so M stands for mobile, and PESA uh, means money in, uh, in Swahili. So launched first in, uh, in, in Kenya, and it came to the realization at that time that uh, there were 11 million mobile phone users in, uh, in Kenya, but a much smaller number of people had a bank account. So the, the initial idea was, is there anything we can do to scale uh, our access and to use the mobile phone as a, as, as a device? And that's really, uh, that's really what, uh, what happened. So the first use case for M-Pesa was send money home. So many people uh, work in uh, large cities like Mombasa or Nairobi. They want to send money to the family. And before M-Pesa, the only way to do it was either to take a bus for two or three days and bring uh, the cash at, at home to their parents, their wife, their, their kids, or give it to a bus driver, actually, would deliver it to a bus station next to the village. And guess what? Uh, what happened uh, sometimes was the envelope disappeared, right? So security and safety was a, was a key issue. So uh, first use case, send money home. The way it worked was the worker would come to an M-Pesa agent. And by agent, imagine a table and an M-Pesa parasol would give the money to the agent, the agent would top up the digital wallet, and then the worker could send money in real time, actually, to the other end of the country, to the village. The family would get it in their own wallet and do a cash out, get, get the cash. And that was an amazing breakthrough at the, at the time. Um, I think M-Pesa reached 1.2 million users after only nine months after, after launch much higher than uh, the business case expectations, with, which is quite unusual in, uh, in tech. Yeah, what were some of the hardest lessons learned? Because MPES has been really successful, but obviously to get to a point of success, you've got to fail at some point and try again. So what was the biggest lesson that you learned? I think one of the challenges was to, I mean, the, the product really became uh, very popular, but uh, to work, you needed a very dense network of agents all around the country. Just to, to give you an order of magnitude, so today we have uh, uh, more than 50 million active users of M-Pesa across eight African markets. 
and we have more than half a million agents. So it took a long time and a lot of effort actually to build that distribution network. I think the main challenge was to build trust with uh, customers because we're dealing with their money. They were not used to banks and uh, digital services and they were, they were worried that they would lose the, the, their money. So what we noticed is that quite often uh, uh, a worker in Nairobi would come put money uh, in, in his wallet at an agent and not send it to the family, but go and cash it out at the agent 20 meters from there to, to check that it was working properly and that the, he would get the money back. And then uh, word of mouth uh, spread and uh, confidence uh, wa was built, obviously launching the service uh, um, under the umbrella of Safaricom was already a very popular brand in, in Kenya, helped. Uh, but that, that was one of the challenges at the, at the beginning. Yeah, that's fascinating. And you talk about community and how important it was to send that money. Tarek, I'd love to bring you in here with what Moja is doing. I mean, you're basing kind of the premise of Moja on really tapping into that community and family spirit. Could you tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing and what you're really seeking to do? So Moja is a smartphone mobile application that allows family and friends to save together, simply, securely, transparently wherever they are in the world. And it's based on the African practice of group saving, which is a global phenomenon. It exists on every continent on the planet. It's called Tanda in South America, Chitfan in India, uh, Chama in Kenya. It's the origin of cooperative banking, and some say banking itself. Um, but as you can imagine, when family and friends come together to save, problems arise. There are problems of trust, transparency, cost, coordination. Um, and there's just a lot of friction in, in, the, in the family saving practice. So Moja is designed to solve for those problems. And we think of ourselves as building on the legacy of M-Pesa. M-Pesa is really the tip of the iceberg. It's the beginning of the financial revolution that's happening in, in Africa. And I think a, as a next step, we need to build products that are designed around the way people actually use money. And if you think about it, a lot of our financial relationships tend to be horizontal between family and friends. But most financial services are built vertically between you and the institution. And basically, technology has got to a point where we're able to wrap technology and wrap services around the way people actually practice money spending, money uh, use. Um, and that's what Mojo is looking to do. OK. And what have been some of the biggest challenges that you found so far as you're kind of expanding? Trust. Trust is the big thing. Um, so, and Peso really revolutionized the, the market. Um, but what's happened in subsequent years is a whole bunch of new companies have come into play. And not all of them have delivered on their promise. So people are, there's a, a, an increased skepticism for new products. And the, the difficulty of getting someone to use a product like Moja is increased by the fact that it is a social product. So if, I, if I'm using a simple financial product, I, it's just me and the company. And what I need to do is trust that company and the, and, and the trust needs to be reciprocated. But if you're saving with, a family, with family and friends, you're putting more on the line than money. You're putting social capital on the line. Mm -hmm. And so people are a little more cautious when using a product like Moja for that reason. Mm -hmm. Ting Ting, I want to bring you in here because Move has been doing some really interesting work across a couple of industries, both in Africa and in the UAE. Could you tell us a little bit about the work that Move does and the gap that it's seeking to address? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Move is a global mobility fintech. Um, we are democratizing access to financial services for mobility gig workers around the world. We also have roots in Africa. Um, and the, the Move foundations or the Move story really started with um, a series of realizations or a series of discoveries. Um, the first is in the, in the mobility or transportation space, right? So um, Africa as a continent has some of the highest road fatality rates in the world, despite having the lowest um, vehicle ownership rate, um, fewer than 200 uh, vehicles per thousand people compared to Europe, you know, 700 plus and even higher in the US. Um, second realization is that uh, the, the transportation um, costs uh, can comprise up to 40% of a, fam a kind of a household's um, income in terms of spending uh, on transportation. So it's a huge driver of the economy. Um, however, 
access to credit has prevented people from being able to, to have access to ownership of vehicles to, to provide means of, of transportation. And then the third realization um, came through the growth of the ride-hailing uh, sector um, on the continent. Um, so I think, you know, hopefully everyone here has been in an Uber or a Bolt or a Kareem or, or, or um, the likes of those companies. Um, as uh, ride-hailing has grown in, in Africa, um, there is a significant shortage of drivers, again, because of the lack of access to credit. So the way that we've gone about solving the problem is to essentially act as the nexus, working in partnership with mobility marketplaces where we can source alternative um, uh, data to be able to assess credit worthiness and productivity, more importantly, of these drivers. And then on the other hand, sourcing capital to be able to purchase the vehicles to then on land to the drivers, and then ultimately interfacing with our customers, the drivers, to be able to provide them a path to asset ownership, a sustainable source of income, um, and then wrapping technology around that to provide additional financial services, um, including health insurance, which most uh, ride-hailing drivers don't have access to anywhere in the world, um, life insurance for, for, for themselves, medical for their, themselves as well as their dependents, um, as well as savings products in the future, credit cards, so that they can build a credit history and can no longer be or will no longer be credit invisible. Yeah, you spoke a lot about sort of that collaboration, and I think that's something I really want to delve into a little bit. You've got amazing work that's happening within the fintech space, some really great innovation, but how can fintech and the traditional financial institutions work better together? Well, there's, um, I think there's, there, there, there are many ways, and, and there's definitely an increase um, in appetite from traditional financial institutions. I think increasingly, and even on the African continent, um, there is recognition that there are um, large groups of unserved and unbanked customers. Um, and these financial institution, institutions are also recognizing that they are not best placed in some cases to serve these customers at their point of need. Um, so then the collaboration between them and the, and the fintechs can be by way of um, whether it's providing um, uh, APIs or kind of the payment infrastructure, the backbones of what the fintechs need to be able to easily process payments or verify um, uh, uh, ident identity or, or um, sources of funds and, and kind of help to streamline the efficiency of fund flow. Um, and, uh, and it's really about unlocking incremental sources of capital to then provide the types of financial products that ultimately the base of the pyramid customers um, need. And then there's, you know, this whole, um, there's, a, there's a whole piece around data access too. So it's, it's the credit history being built on productivity data. In our case, it's also vehicle telematics data, so driving um, behaviors, um, you know, how the driver treats the vehicle and how that integrates into the credit underwriting process. So there's, there's a lot of really interesting work um, and potential collaboration on how we actually leverage this data to unlock new products and create new products um, to serve the customer at their point of need. Philippe, I saw you nodding along there. Did you want to yeah, add I mean, in something? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, many things to build, to build, to build on. Um, I think, yeah, th th there is a lot to do in Africa. So cooperation is, uh, is, is key. And uh, I'm going to maybe give you a few examples on uh, uh, how it works for M-Pesa. So M-Pesa is itself as an ecosystem, as a platform, as a foundation enablers to allow great companies like yours to uh, built on, 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 top, uh, on top of it. Funny enough, a couple of years ago, we won an, the award of the best digital bank in the world. We're not even a bank. We don't have a license. We work with banks, right? And uh, I wanted to mention one of the most transformative use cases that we've launched, and that's lending and micro-lending. So today, I mean, every day, M-Pesa grants hundreds of thousands of microloans, really transforming the lives of, of millions of, uh, of, of people. To, to, uh, to give a concrete example, a typical loan would be granted at 6 a.m. in the morning to a woman who would take the money, buy three chicken, go to the market, resell the chicken, pay back the loan, and make a living out of it. And how does it work? 
the money is not lent out of the M-Pesa balance sheet. It's a partnership with, the, with, with banks, right? So across the markets, we have established a marketplace of lending where different banks can uh, plug in. They provide the expertise, they provide the, the, the capital, and we provide the reach to uh, dozens of millions of uh, M-Pesa customers. We provide the data, the credit score, uh, and it, it wouldn't work with, without, uh, without uh, our partners. Partners. So that's the way it works for lending, that's the same way it works for uh, international remittances. So we work with all the key players, uh, the World Remit, Remitly, uh, Western Union of this world, and they are all connected to M-Pesa and other mobile wallets to ter terminate the, the traffic. So again, it's a, it's a vibrant eco ecosystem, and um, th that's the only way to make it, uh, to make it work. Yeah, that's Tarek, so I was going to say, I think increasingly there's a recognition amongst banks that they need to collaborate with fintechs. I, I, uh, I spent a lot of time in East Africa over the last three years, traveled the region, and I've spoken to uh, dozens of banks. And the overwhelming response I get is positive. They're, they're excited by the possibility, they see the, the, the market opportunity, and they recognize that if they don't act soon, they're going to lose out to a huge market. From our end, as, as, as startups, we see the value of being able to engage with a regulated entity, with a track record, with a brand name. But the difficulty is cultural. These big organizations, I mean, banks are in their nature, and we wouldn't want them to be any other way, really. In their nature, they're very conservative. Um, but that conservatism plays out in long timelines, lots of bureaucracy, uh, complex procedures. And that, that kind of culture is anti-innovation, and it can kill a startup trying to move quickly to market, to raise money, to, to hit, to get customers. So I think, I think we need to see a cultural shift. I mean, we, on, on our side as, as startups, we, we try to be patient as best we can and to work with that system, but, but ultimately we need to see a shift in, in the banking systems, um, a cultural shift. Um, which we've seen in other countries, like in the UK, there's, there's been a massive shift in, in banking culture to, and, and attitudes towards startups. And I think that's the kind of thing that needs to be adopted in Africa. And, and to, be clear, to be clear, sorry, some banks get it and they, they partner with fintech and uh, create a lot of value and some, some banks just don't get it and they will be marginalized because yeah. the, the next wave of customers will be digital. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But Tarek, I want to come back because there's quite a fine line that one has to walk, right, when it comes to at the end of the day, you've got the responsibility of the customer's money with you. So where does one go in the fintech space when it comes to regulation? What should you be doing? What is your responsibility there? I mean, yeah, we have to, you have to take, it's a sacred trust. Um, there's a, a phrase in Arabic, which I really love, amana, which literally means sacred trust. And I always think our customer's money with us is that. And it really comes down to basic um, accounting. You know, it comes keeping good records, uh, running you know your customer systems, um, being really good on, um, on reporting and regulation. And, uh, and it's about creating a culture within the organization that treats customers' money as a sacred trust. Um, and there's always a tension, obviously, because you're trying to move quickly. But I don't think there's any way around it. The, the move fast and break things principle that was so popular in the, in the early 20, 2000s with Facebook just doesn't work with fintech. You need to move quickly and build things. Ting Ting, do you agree with that? And do you think we can lean on AI now? I mean, I have to bring AI into this conversation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, as a company that's operating in so many different jurisdictions, we're in seven different countries now, um, having AI play a a role within whether it's um, legal, risk, and compliance. Um, I think that can definitely improve efficiency um, within startups, for sure. Um, with regards to um, navigating regulation, I think there's, there's two sides. Internally, in terms of how we treat our customers and how we engage with them, safeguarding for us is very, very important. Um, and I think here it's 
maybe AI has less of a role because it is very much about trust. It is about the relationship that we have with our customers and there is still continuing education in terms of ensuring that they understand the legal contracts that they're entering into, that they understand um, their commitments as well as ours um, and, uh, and what the ramifications are um, if either party kind of breaches those. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking through affordability of our product because we have seen in so many cases in emerging markets where um, you know, loan sharks are out there just to make uh, a buck off of our customers and, and we don't want to create the same kind of debt trap. We actually want to create a path of, of economic freedom for our customers. Um, so uh, I think I mean, you know, data, data and AI can play a role in terms of how can we iterate more quickly and design products um, more efficiently and more effectively um, and more affordably for our customers. And then in terms of you know, externally how we deal with regulators. Um, because we're at the intersection of the future of mobility and the future of work, and also um, we're, we're also uh, pushing the envelope in terms of electrification of fleets um, in many different markets, there are times very unclear or vague uh, rules in place in terms of how one can operate. Um, and so here, I think, as a startup, we, we have to test the waters and be innovative. and at the same time engage um, with various stakeholders. So we do spend quite a bit of time mapping out who are the key stakeholders, what are their plans, what are their priorities, how do we engage with them so we're, we're you know, engaging in conversation as opposed to uh, moving too quickly and breaking things in the process. <laughs> Yeah, Philippe, I'd like to ask you, let's say we're in this space of generative AI, this is the year of AI, everyone's talking about it. If AI had been around when M-Pesa was launched, how would you have done things differently? Um, I think the foundation would have been the, <coughs> the same, right? So uh, what, what I talked about, the dense distribution network, we, we would have probably modeled the, the flows of people using data from bus and uh, tuk-tuk drivers and so on to put the agent at the, at the, at the right, uh, right place. I think the, the first layer was to build a digital wallet used by 50 million uh, users and across the industry, mobile money 400 million, so with a big impact on, uh, on financial inclusion. I think maybe for next uh, year, COGIX, I think the theme should be financial wellness. So uh, inclusion is the, is the basics, having an account, but what do you do with the account, right? And uh, there is so much more we can do in, uh, in, in, in credit, saving, so uh, allowing people to save money for opportunities, but also to absorb shock of lives. And uh, there is a lot of education that needs to go through uh, the system to explain what is a saving account, what is a unit fund uh, for wealth management and so on. And given the, the low revenue we're getting on the population in Africa, the low RPU, as we say in the telco industry, it's absolutely essential to automatize and use AI. And I'm convinced that chatbots on uh, financial advisory will be key for the, the customers we, uh, we, we, we target. And uh, I'm really excited uh, about it. We need it now and uh, for, for the second phase of the, of the financial wellness world. Tarek, Cogex theme for this year. How will we get the next 10 years right? Look into your crystal ball. What are you thinking when it comes to financial inclusion? Can I, can I build on the, the, Absolutely. The, the point about AI? I think that's, and this will tie in with your question about the future. I think there's all kinds of exciting applications for AI on the back end, automating compliance, improving KYC, checking for money laundering, acting potentially as a, as a, as a means of, of offering loans. And, but I think what's super exciting about AI and, and what's super exciting about this next generation of AI is that we're in a position to offer our customers financial advice and financial literacy that would traditionally only be available to the elite. So our vision at Moja, and we're building this now, is to, for every savings group, every group of family and friends to have their own personal financial advisor and teaching them not just you know, how to borrow money, but how to save money, how to invest money how to improve their savings group practices. And I think this, this is a revolution that, that could 
just you know, transform people's relationships with money. For most, most of us, money is an emotional thing. It's an approximate, you know, it, it, it's embedded in the sacred. It's, it's, uh, you know, you, it, it, it's, it's not dealt with with the same uh, skill that financial services have. And I think AI has the potential to level the playing field so that the customer and the financial service are you know, on equal footing when they're tr working together. And uh, I think that's a really, really exciting potential for, for AI. Um, I have lots to say about the future, but I'll stop there because I, I reckon I've only got a few minutes. Yeah, we've got just yeah. under, um, or just over five minutes left. Um, but Ting Ting, I'd love to ask you, what do you think the future of FinTech holds? That's a big question. Um, the future of FinTech. So, I mean, I think for us, what's most exciting about the future is um, their well, it's exciting, but also there's um, kind of considerations uh, related to AI, which is um, autonomous vehicles. Um, and what does that mean for our customer base? What does that mean for our model? What does that mean in terms of how we can continu continue to build for the gig workspace? Um, so I guess watch the space. We're, we're researching it and, and trying to formulate our views, but I think that's both um, potentially interesting challenge and, and also an area of opportunity. Um, with that in mind, it's then focusing on how do we leverage um, AI and other tools to be able to um, uh, better understand and better reach and better serve our customers, um, whether they're within mobility or other areas of gig work. Um, and then finally, uh, we also have an impact goal around the electrification of mobility, which I referred to earlier, and that's um, uh, using fintech and our fintech kind of flywheel and our fintech model to unlock opportunities to accelerate the decarbonization of transport. Um, there's huge amounts of data within the EV ecosystem um, that we can, we can also use and you know, we're, we're also exploring how, how, do we, how, do we, um, uh, how do we use leverage carbon credits, for example, with our EV fleet uh, here in the UK and also in the UAE. Um, and are there other partners in terms of um, how we can continue to build and, and, and expand the EV infrastructure? Um, so that I think there's a, there's a lot more that we can do um, kind of at the intersection of financial services, fintech, mobility, and the future of work. Great. Well, I'm down to the final question. You have a minute each to answer this one. Oh. We've all been talking about how great the African continent has been when it comes to fintech and innovation. So I'm going to go from my left-hand side. Tarek, starting with you. Is Africa the place that's going to show the rest of the world how to build an inclusive financial uh, economy? Absolutely. No, I, I think there's, there's so much that's exciting about Africa at the moment. Um, one, it's a huge and growing population. Two, it's a young continent. The average age is 18. The average age in Europe is 42. So there's just an enormous amount of energy and sense of possibility. Uh, there's an appetite for, for new products. There's an appetite for risk. There's enormous entrepreneurship taking place. Um, and there's the potential to design a whole range of new products based around social networks that have ceased to exist in many parts of the world, the extended family, the clan, the tribe. Think about what it would look like to build products for that kind of net, highly networked community. And the possibilities are endless. So Africa's not a, a, a subspecialism anymore. It, it's the future. Ting Ting? Yeah, and there's also so much dynamism on the continent. I mean, it's not homogenous at all. Um, there are um, a lot of really interesting um, ideas and innovation coming from the ground across the entire continent. And I think one of the interesting things um, for a startup to be operating and developing solutions for the continent is that it, it's a new frontier. It, you know, startups maybe have less access to capital because it's lesser known, although there are you know, increasing investor interest on the continent. And because of those constraints, people are forced to be more creative um, and more solutions oriented and to work within those constraints. And I think there's going to be a lot more interesting and exciting things to come out from there. I believe, what about India? I'm going to throw it to another continent. Yeah, in, in India, I mean, uh, the, the Indian government did a fantastic job to catch up, actually. So India was, was behind uh, Africa, and um, uh, I'm fully supportive of what you said. And uh, we see in India what happened in, in Africa before. 
which is the, the leapfrogging to mobile internet, right? Uh, the, no, no fixed internet, you need to find solution, creativity, innovation in Africa, they develop new services that work on, uh, on mobile phone, and uh, India actually took this idea and uh, implemented it the Indian way with the strong support from the government. I think what India did great is that uh, they built this infrastructure of uh, KYC and digital ID that actually some African markets should probably use to move to the, to the next level. So the, uh, the development of uh, services in India with uh, Paytm and others, QR code payment and lending and so on. We see similar trends in, uh, in India and, uh, and Africa and also in the Philippines or uh, other uh, Southeast Asia con countries. So really exciting time. I'm, I'm really bullish about the potential. We're adding probably 200, 300 million new mobile internet users and that's that the foundation for new innovative services. Great. Well, this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Thank you all of you for your insights and your time. Need I say that uh, perhaps the developing world is going to show the developed world the future when it comes to financial inclusion and building a more inclusive world for all of us. Thank you, audience. Uh, thank you, our virtual audience as well. And uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you.